Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Rockford Horror Film Festival. And this was our first Q&A, so it was a very exciting, really strong start to the festival. So I'm joined here by John Williams, who's the writer, director, producer yeah, of How's uh, <laughs> the Keeping Death? And David Ellison, who is the, the same, the writer, director, <laughs> producer of Familiar. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, John, I know you've come quite a way today. Yeah, that's right. come from uh, Stoke. Mm. Yeah, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank David, where have you come from today? Uh, Wigan. Oh, great. Yeah. So. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> if I'd have known, we could have hitched up. We could have yeah. been down together. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We could have shared a tree. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mentioned this is a really strong start to the festival. Uh, Familiar has been nominated for four awards. Uh, best short, best director, cinematography and score. So congratulations. We really, really loved the, the film. Thank you. Uh, Tables of Creeping Death, two awards, best feature and best actor for Andrew Redburn. So yeah, uh, two films we really enjoyed in the panel. So really great to have you here. Good. Um, how was it watching with your films with an audience? Do you enjoy watching your own films or do you not? I'll start with John. Um, parts of it... I do, yeah, parts of it I don't. I for example, I disappeared for half an hour through this film. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those things. But part of, yeah, partially I like, partially I don't. David, do you like watching your own films back? I'm, I'm fed up to the back teeth, uh -huh. familiar, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, I've seen it too many times now. We, we had a really long post on it which meant just going over and over changes relentlessly. What's really nice is coming to a venue like this where, because we got a proper 5.1 mix done, and you know, these are the places to hear that kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, it was nice. It's, it's always nice to hear the sound as it was meant to be, instead of just off a computer. Yeah, the sound is absolutely brilliant. No, I, oh, thank you. I've obviously seen it at home on a small screen, but I was in here and when it started and there was one bit I absolutely jumped out myself. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the sound is fantastic. Oh, I'll pleasure. So I'm just going to ask both of you um, how you first came up with the idea of your films as you're the writers. Um, yeah, do you want to start, John? Where you first... I suppose I, my, se my second film was Christmas Curse. It was like a sort of clown film. I wanted to do something more along the lines of um, Hammer Horror, that kind of thing. And that's sort of where you come from. Um, along the lines of sort of Hammer Horror, that kind of thing, um, Asylum, um, Hammer House of Horror, that kind of thing. That's all that kind of stuff I want to bring, bring to it. And yeah, this kind of stuff I was inspired by when I was a kid. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Sorry. No, no, cool, man. Uh, uh, familiar um, was initially a, a feature film that I've written. And um, when I would send it to people to, to read, I felt like they weren't getting it and they were coming up with what they thought it should look and feel like. Okay. So I, th I said, oh, right, I'm going to make a short and I gave myself a budget. I said, I'm not going to go past that. And then it just went beyond that and became oh. silly, silly money. Um, but it, it was, it was ba the project itself was based off, I was watching the 1979 Salem's Lot. And when you've got the, you know, J the James Mason uh, actor and, um, you know, he turns and he goes into the house and he's being, and, and, you know, closes the door and you think, what, what goes on in the house between him and, and the Mr. Barlow? Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's just a cool idea, you know, yeah. these guys and they're just, you know, the, the, what if the vampire was victimising him and it was almost like a domestic abuse yeah. kind of thing. He's almost like, you know, the beaten spouse. Um, and he can't do right for doing wrong, even when he does right, he's, you know, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And yeah, so it, it was, it was mainly, a, 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 you know, just trying to get across to people the tone and vibe of the, of the full project. And then it, it just kind of grew out of hand, basically. Mm. Yeah, that was one of the things I liked about, about it the most was how, obviously, we've seen so many films about vampires, but this was from a different angle. I thought that was a really interesting part mm. of the idea. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, let's talk about casting. So, uh, we'll start with you this time, David. How did you cast the, obviously you've only got a single actor in there, um, but he does an absolute, well, and maybe, I don't know if there was any stand-ins for the creature, I don't know, but he does an absolutely brilliant job. How did you cast? Um, yeah, getting hold of the main actor was one of the biggest worries I had because I really wanted someone who didn't look 
quintessentially from a country. I wanted him to look, you know, you couldn't pin down where he was from. Um, and I was just flicking through actor profiles on Spotlight and Hugo came up and he just had this kick-ass profile pic. I was like, wow, he looks like he's from a Bond movie or something. Yeah. And um, I checked out his reel and he was just so internal the way he acted. And I was getting offered other actors. We were trying to get some names involved. We were actually speaking to, I can't remember the dude's name. He played Jamie Lannister in Game of Thrones. We were trying to get him attached. Uh, and his agent was up for it, but for, for whatever reason, it, it, it couldn't work out. And, and then I went back to Hugo. Uh, I literally just offered it to him on the spot, didn't audition him. I just, I just looked at his reel and I just had a gut, inst gut instinct for him being the right guy. And uh, the monster uh, was, a, was a guy called Rick Wiltshire who's just like six and a half feet tall. Right. And he's done this kind of thing before. And I just said, are you claustrophobic? And he said, no. And I'm like, right, okay, cool, you're our man. Ooh. So it, it was very much, um, with, the, with the way he worked, I had such a strong mind of what, how I wanted him to move and so forth. It was almost like I would position him like an action figure. Be like, right, okay, I want you to do this and that. Okay, just hold that. And yeah, but no, uh, our cast was just dynamite. Hugo was dynamite and he came up with so many great little minutiae ideas on his performance that just like, we were like, wow, we didn't even think of doing that. And just really wicked little moments that came out of nowhere. Yeah, he does a great job. Um, John, so obviously you've got some pretty big names, household names really in your film. How did they come around? Um, it was a case of sort of um, asking around. Uh, obviously, we had quite a low budget with the whole film, so yeah, see what we could find with the uh, yeah. If you don't ask, you don't get. Right? <laughs> exactly, we just asked, just asked yeah. around. Yeah, so yeah, uh, Ricky said yes. He said yeah, okay, cool. And we had a good day with Ricky and just filmed Ricky and yeah, it was good. Ricky Tomlinson, yeah. So um, yeah. you mentioned earlier that he also helped you out, and I saw he's got a lot of big thanks in the credit as well. For some of the locations or some of the extras? Yeah, that he he helped so, out with? yeah, he's just been it in general. He just he was just such a, such a lovely guy, you know. He just um, uh, provided a location to film at the pub, and you know, he was just really nice. You know. Something that's sort of lacking in today's society. You know. So you're uh, mainly set kind of in one room and a corridor. Where did you film the film? Uh, How long did it take as well? Uh, we shot over, so it was one day of pre-light, uh, three days on set. Mm -hmm. So that, that whole place was a set and the bathroom and the cellar was on location in Manchester. Okay. So it was, it was four day shoot, one day pre-light. Um, we initially did look around to try and shoot it as a location, but um, the problem we were having is most of the manor houses in the UK have got a very specific style. It's very Downton Abbey-ish. Right. Uh, or it was too gothic, um, and I was trying to get away from that. I wanted a bit more, like, you know, Resident Evil kind of, you know, I'm slightly, a, you know, American co colonial type build. And um, it was my DOP who suggested we build on sets, and I asked around, and I was like, it's, it's going to cost too much. And then, I don't know why, but we just made the decision, and we found a place in Liverpool that would build us the sets. They mainly built for theatre, and they, they hadn't really done much, much film-related stuff before, but they gave us a really good price and um, just came through in, in ridiculous. I mean, the, the set was so good. There was just loads of little little things, like little chips in the wood that they'd intentionally put in. And, you know, in the film, there's like um, uh, a white square where a painting used to be, and that was their idea. You know, because I said, they said, do you want to paint enough? I said, no, not really. They said, what about a white square where one used to be? And it's all yellowed around it. And it was just little things like that that just made it feel real. I think, I think, we've, actually, <laughs> I think we've actually done ourselves out of potentially winning um, some production design awards because most people who've seen it think that we shot it on a proper location and we never said that it was a set. Right. So we've, we saw other, other shorts winning production design. I was like, we've not even been nominated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we should have said, hey, we built that. Yeah. You know, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, it looks fantastic, it really does. Um, Spencer, was there any questions out in the audience? I've got some more. Yeah, anybody got any questions? Put your hand up if you've got a question. Here? Spencer will come and find you. Go on. Go on in the front, I think. Don't be scared. Hi, uh, so my question is, uh, what was the budget on your productions and what was the greatest challenge you had to overcome whilst filming? Familiar uh, had, a, had a budget of 50k. Um, it was primarily, that was down to the sets um, and some of the heavy equipment that we had to get in, like techno cranes and things like that. We 
got the money through basically me living on beans on toast for 18 months and saving everything I had. And so it, it's, it's primarily self-funded. Uh, the greatest challenge, I don't know if it was a challenge, it was more of a worry. And, and we, we, we kind of nailed it early on, which I was surprised at, was, was the VFX. Because um, we needed a good VFX guy and I just didn't have any connections with anybody. So I just put a post out on a Facebook latex mask group and just said, hey, is anybody keen? And a guy called Dimitri got in touch who, he does stuff for Disney. He's, he's working on the live action, The Little Mermaid and stuff like that. And he was like, yeah, I'll do it. And he, he wound up just like, he wound up doing it and charging us just for materials to make the creature. And uh, cause his, his mentality was, you know, when I'm doing Disney, it's very much corporate. And I want to get back into the vibe of like, you know, an evil dead type movie or whatever and Grindhouse and all that. So he, he liked the enthusiasm of the project and yeah, did a kick-ass monster for us. So that, that was the big worry, but we got it fixed. John, what was your biggest challenge on this film? Um, staying sober. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's still fighting it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry, it's been a long, such a long day. I'm so sorry. Um, I suppose, like, you know, like the guy said, it's it's the budget, the whole thing, the everything, big everything together, and yeah, it's, it's, it's such a difficult, um, yeah. Is what it is. So, but yeah, it's good fun. It's good fun. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. It. Well, yeah, yeah. So. Um, what we're we working on next, both of you. So, John, what are you working on next? Uh, I'm, I've just finished work on a comedy, full feature length comedy called Saint Baptist. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, that is what it is. Like a um, style. Sorry. Like a yeah, like a mockumentary style, a bit like The Office, stroke, um, spiral tap, that kind of thing. Uh, and also, um, I'm going to start work on two horror films next year. Um, features. Which features, features, all features, yeah. All features, yeah. So, yeah, so all good. Uh, David, what's your next project? Um, we, we've got the feature version of Familiar that we're trying to mm-hmm. get out there, really. Um, we've got a couple of actors that we're trying to get in front of, <coughs> connections with a couple of heavy hitters, the, the, the only heavy hitters that we know, but... We know people who know them, so uh, trying to do that, trying to get a budget towards it, and yeah, get it in front of companies like Blumhouse would be the ideal thing, but you know, see what happens. Yeah, they're doing okay at the minute. Yeah, right? yeah. Great stuff. So, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for submitting your film. Oh, no, thank you very and, much. And uh, yeah. Why did the guy wait till everybody in the bingo room was dead before he <laughs> shot the bingo? We're all wondering why did he wait that long? Why could he maybe shot a little sooner? Because <laughs> at, at the end, he writes in his little book saying no, no witnesses. He can't, no witnesses whatsoever, nothing can be seen. Don't leave any witnesses. Yeah. No witnesses. <laughs> Got another one at the back. Okay. Hello, congratulations. Good. Had a question about an output question. Um, what was your decision to. What was your decision to uh, come back to the doll, basically collecting another soul? What was the decision behind that, and why was the doll number fifteen? Um, because that was part of the story, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it just was. <laughs> it just was. It was. That's how it was. That's how it came about. So yeah. Well, Everything was done on purpose. <laughs> Hi there. Um, do your films uh, break even or make money? Are you hoping to make money or break even? To John. To me. Yeah. To my um. It depends really because I've I've I'm quite new to all this. In case you haven't gathered. Um. <laughs> It's I'm all quite used to this, so um, it depends where you put your your, your platform is, you know, uh, Amazon, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah, you can you can make money off stuff like this, but yeah. Are you planning to put this film out into like online or anything after it's on the festival? This, this one, um, 
eventually, yeah, hopefully um, distribution. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So. And David, you're um, we're obviously trying to make the feature. So. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we're going to make the money back on the short. It's literally just, hey, here we are. Look at what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of an investment for down the line. But um, there's a, a YouTube channel called Alter. Uh, there's Dust and Alter, and Dust do sci-fi and Alter do horrors, and they've offered to uh, premiere the short on their channel. Uh, we're just waiting to kind of like sort a of, few sort of bits and pieces out and get a date, but um, that's a really good platform because some big names have, have come off the back of that and then been picked up by, you know, management in the US and then gone on to make, you know, multi-million pound features, so who knows? Could, could lead us somewhere. Great stuff. No? Then in that case, you are free to go. <laughs>